Preserve us, O God, for in you we take refuge. We say to the Lord, you are our Lord. We have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all our delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. God, we ask for your preservation and your protection for your people around the world, for the nations that are in turmoil in this hour, for the evil that is escalating for the divisions that are multiplying, we pray that the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, would come and rain down upon these lands so that every man, woman, child would know true peace in their hearts, the peace that comes from the only God in all the world, and that is you. And Father, we pray right now that especially the families that are in fear, the families that are in hiding, the families that are imprisoned across these nations under deep persecution, that you would breathe new strength, hope, joy into their hearts today. That they would be able to count it all loss compared to knowing more of you. And we pray that their faith would remain strong despite the increase of uncertainties that surround them. That they would know that as long as their foot is on the rock of Jesus Christ, they are on sure ground. And God, we look to you now, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we ask that today, God, you would begin a new story in the hearts of people who have yet to know you. And in those who have sought to live for you and trusted in you, that you would continue writing our faith story today to know you more, to trust you more, to love you more, because we have encountered the living God through your living word today. Father, I surrender myself to you and I ask that you would fill me with your spirit, cover me with your grace, Anoint me and allow the Spirit to preach through me so that life would be given today through your word. So that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart would be pleasing and bring you honor, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. And it is in your majestic and matchless name we pray. Amen. You know, the past few weeks, the eyes of the world have been fixated toward the northern plains of Iraq, to a city that was once called Nineveh, where the prophet Jonah first delivered God's message of repentance to that city thousands of years ago. That city responded, repented, and have had worshipers of Jehovah for, there for centuries after Jonah's first mission trip there. But today in that city, which is now called Mosul, you will no longer find worshipers of God. And it is not because they have disappeared, it is not because of apathy, it is not because believers somehow are no more, it is because the thousands of believers who once occupied that city have been forced out. The Islamic State, IS or ISIS, have told Christians to either convert to Islam or be killed. 
And as a symbol of the radical change that has happened in that city, the ISIS group also destroyed a few weeks ago the tomb of Jonah, that prophet who came many centuries ago to point the people to the only true God. They desecrated and destroyed the tomb, and they think that they destroyed the God of Jonah as well. But as horrific as it may seem to destroy the grave of this prophet, for the believer, we know that Jonah is no longer in the grave. You see, the grave does not have the final word for believers. Our times of suffering and pain, they too do not have the final word. There is only one person who determines the final word of our lives, and his name is Jesus, who is also called Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. He alone is the final word in all things. Amen? And though our days are dark, the darkness is not the final destiny for those who trust in Jesus. Our destiny is not for destruction. Our life is not meant to stay in darkness. Because our God is the light of the world. And that is the message that Peter has for the suffering church today. In this portion of his letter that we have been studying for the past few weeks, he is reminding the suffering, the persecuted, and the pain-filled Christians that though you are in pain, this is not your final story. That no matter how difficult your days may be in Christ, there is always hope. And no matter how hard your life is today, there is a ray of light that will pierce through any darkness in order to draw you back into his glorious light. And that's the encouragement that Peter wants us to focus on today. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 6 and following. And we want to explore today Peter's encouraging word for the suffering church. And that is that there is hope for those who suffer. That there is a bright side even to our dark days. So follow along with me in your outlines as well. And we want to look at how we can see our difficult days in light of the hope that we have in Christ. So first of all, we learn today that... Trials are temporary. So I've already repeat, trials are temporary. Trials are temporary, and what we'll also learn is that they serve a purpose. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and following. It says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he begins by saying in this portion of his letter, in this we rejoice. Though we are suffering, though you are going through difficulties, in this we can rejoice as we keep our eyes on Jesus and his great mercy for us, who has given to us a living hope that we looked at last week, we can rejoice in this truth. That though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, one of the ways that you could translate this verse, the end of verse 6, is him saying, you have been burdened by many different kinds of sufferings and trials. And so he is reminding us that in this world we will face difficulties. In this fallen, broken, sin-stained world, part of the reason why it is still broken is manifested in the fact that we suffer in this world. That there is hardships that we will face. Broken relationships and broken dreams. Divorce and death. Miscarriages and miscommunications. Persecution and pain. 
Henry Nouwen once said, it would be just another illusion to believe that reaching out to God will free us from pain and suffering. Often indeed, it is this reaching out to God that will take us to places that we would rather not go. But afterwards, we will realize that without going there, we will not find the life we were meant to know. So he's reminding us, don't fool yourself into thinking that life will be pain-free. Because especially for Christians, we will suffer in this world. Jesus told us that, that in this world you will have trouble and persecution. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. But also we are reminded that in this broken and fallen world, still cursed by sin, we live in a world that hates Jesus Christ. And we are seeing the manifestation of this reality in full force in Iraq today. With the persecution and evil that is happening to believers, with this terrorist army group, ISIS, killing Christian men, harming children, using women and girls as sex slaves, this is how ugly sin is when left alone. This is how evil and dangerous sin is when left unattended to. And this is why Jesus Christ came into this world, to die for sinners. And this is why the world needs Jesus, and this is why we need to send missionaries to places like Iraq, Iran, North Korea, and Syria. Amen? It is because of this pain, it is because of this brokenness that Jesus Christ came into this world and he came to give us hope, a living hope that is found in him that people who are being crushed by the weights of this broken world can know that there is hope through Christ. Peter reminds us today that in the midst of all these trials and tribulations that we will suffer, that we will go through in this fallen world. He gives us hope by reminding us today that all trials are temporary in the Lord. That is good news for believers. Why? Because for all of us who have faith in Christ, suffering will not last forever. That is good news. Why? Because if you reject Christ, if you do not put your faith in Christ, that is not your reality. Because for those who reject Christ, suffering will never end. You will suffer throughout this broken world, and when you die without Christ, you will suffer in greater anguish through an eternal flame in hell that will never be quenched. So the fact that Peter can say today that though you suffer many trials for a little while, that is hopeful for the believer. The fact that suffering will end for certain is reason for joy, that this too will pass. So turn to somebody next to you and say, this too will pass. You see, there is an incredible necessity for the human heart to know hope in the midst of suffering, that this too will end. You know, I shared the story of how I got into a scooter accident a couple years ago, and it was one of the most physically painful experiences of my life. And the only thing that got me through, because I went into a scooter accident, it ripped open my knee so you could see the bone. And then um, the doctors tried to stitch it together, local anesthetic that was not working after like 10 tries. So I had to just endure through physically feeling every pull, stretch, and stitch to my knee. And literally, the only thing that kept me going was the thought, this will end one day. <laughs> that was the only thing that I could hold on to because it was extremely painful. Hope has that kind of power to allow you to go through seasons of pain. There was two groups of soldiers that they did a psychological experiment upon. They told the first group of soldiers simply to march, not knowing when they will end. So they marched for hours. 
And after three hours, they told them to stop. A second group, they told them, march for three hours. And at the end of it, they stopped. And then they did uh, stress tests on both groups. The first group that was simply told to march, they registered stress at such a higher rate than the second group. Why? Because they knew, the second group knew this is going to end. But the first group experienced so much more stress because they did not know when this would end. That's the power of hope. It can change how we perceive our persecution. You see, we will suffer many kinds of trials, all kinds of sufferings, but in Christ, all trials are temporary. They will end. Amen? That is good news. All suffering will end for believers. All pain will end. All sickness will end. And it is only for a little while. And even in the midst of all the injustices that we see happening in this country and around the world and even in the U.S. right now with so many riots happening because of the racial tensions that are happening and we cry out for justice, in Christ we know that one day God will right all wrongs. God will restore all things in the end. God will bring justice one day and vindication one day. That is our hope because we trust in a good and sovereign God. Amen? So the good news is that trials are temporary, but they also serve a purpose. 1 Peter 1.6, In this rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary... You have been grieved by various trials. So God uses pain for a purpose. For all suffering is also serving a sovereign purpose in the end. And we will explore that purpose a bit more next by realizing also that trials are a test. So everyone repeat, trials are a test. So the hope that Peter gives to the suffering church is that trials are temporary for those of us who are in Christ. Suffering will end one day. Jesus will wipe away our tears one day. But also, in the midst of going through the trials here, we need to remember as a people of faith that the trials that we go through, they function as a test. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 again, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So we go through so many hardships, so many betrayals, so many hard times. Verse 7, why did they come? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though, it's, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The reason why these trials came was so that our faith would be properly tested. Every trial we face is a test of faith. For one thing, there's various tests that it functions as, but for one thing, it functions as an eye test. What do I mean? It will cause us to examine how good your vision of faith really is. We mentioned last week how the gospel transforms our vision to be able to see reality properly. Through the gospel, we can see the world for what it really is, dust that will perish, and we can see Christ for who he really is, the greatest treasure in all the world. Trials function as an eye test to check how well we can see reality and into eternity. You see, without faith in Christ, we are all nearsighted. When you do not know Christ yet, like the rest of the world, we can only see what is right in front of us. We can only see this physical, temporary world, and we think that this world is everything. That we live for this. We live for money. We live for things that will not last because all we can believe in are things that we see. We are nearsighted. We cannot see and think in light of eternity. And that's vision without faith. But in Christ, we can see beyond today and into eternity because faith allows us to see everything in light of its proper perspective 
of eternity. So we ask, how does this choice impact eternity? Not just how does this impact how I feel right now. How does this relationship impact eternity and bring about honor in the end? How does this trial prepare me for eternity? You see, it is a test of vision to see if I truly see God accurately and biblically. Satan seeks to destroy faith in God through pain in our lives, through unfair treatments, through violence and attacks against you, through loss of money and possessions, through sickness and disease. The enemy wants you to lose faith, lose hope, and lose love for Jesus. And so he will throw pain in our path. But it is in the pits of pain that the fight of faith happens, which will make us bitter or better in our walk with Christ. It is a test to see what do I really believe about God and his goodness, his character, and his sovereign control over all things. Do you run to God or run away from God when you suffer? You must always remember this life principle of faith that pain will either purify or poison your faith depending on who you believe. If you believe the lies of the enemy, that God's not good, God's not in control, God doesn't care about your life, God is distant, God doesn't give a rip if you suffer or not. If you believe the lies of the enemy, your faith will be poisoned through the pain. But if you believe and fight the good fight of faith in the pit of pain, that God is in control, God is good, even though I do not understand his ways, that his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher, so I still trust him. When you fight the fight of faith and hold on to Christ through pain, that pain will purify your faith in the end. Verse 7, 1 Peter 1, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise. Suffering and pain will reveal the true condition of our faith. You see, where, when there is no shaking, everything appears to be fine. When there is no shaking, all buildings look strong. But when an earthquake hits, that reveals which buildings had a strong foundation and which did not. And the shaking that suffering does to our faith will reveal the quality of our faith. You see, suffering shakes us to the very core of who we are. Everything else is pushed aside. All the trivial things in our lives, they don't matter when we go through the earthquake of suffering. Only the bare essentials, only the most valuable things to our hearts are fixated upon. What is left is what we really believe, who we really are, and what we really depend upon. C.S. Lewis once said this about suffering. God has not been trying an experiment on my faith or love in order to find out their quality. He knew it already. It was I who didn't. He always knew that my temple was a house of cards. His only way of making me realize that was to knock it down. Suffering reveals the quality of our faith. But it not only reveals true faith, suffering refines true faith. Peter tells us that trials do to faith what fire does to gold. It purifies it. It refines it. You see, fire purifies gold and shows us what it's really made out of. It pushes all impurities to the surface, things that need to be cut off and pruned, and it will be ugly at times what surfaces, what comes up. And when we go through the fire of affliction, a lot of ugliness comes to the surface as well. Our self-centeredness, our hatred, our lack of faith, but that ugliness shows us the inadequacies of ourselves. 
and our need for a Savior. You see, no matter what age we are, we will forever be students in life. For believers, of course, we are in a school of discipleship with our teacher and Savior, Jesus Christ. But another school we will always keep going back to on this side of eternity is the school of suffering. It seems that school is the graduate level place where God educates, equips, and trains his people for true discipleship. In Acts 14, we read how Paul and Barnabas encouraged the believers in Antioch with the words, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And I realize that more than anything else, it is suffering that reveals the true condition and the maturity of our faith more than anything else. Faith can easily be hidden and even ignored in days of sunshine. But it is in our days of pain that the strength and stability of our faith is test tested and shown for what it really is. A lie that the Western world has bought into is the mindset that becoming a Christian means pain-free, easy living, wealth, and prosperity. But Christianity is the way of the cross. And the cross is a symbol of suffering and death. Suffering is a part of life, but it is a part of life that allows us to partake in the life of Christ. And it is a part of life where we realize the horror of sin within us, within the world, and the desperate need of something or someone stronger and greater than our frail lives. When we embrace suffering as partnership with Christ and when we no longer become bitter in our days of hardships, but instead learn to trust Him no matter what, then we finally graduate to the next level of living and the next level of faith in this school of suffering. Instead of cursing the darkness, let us be a people who hope in the light. So we must pray for greater faith, greater wisdom, greater love during our seasons of suffering so that Christ would always be our everything. But in the midst of the pain and the fire that we are in, we must remember, God is not an arsonist. He is a refiner. He is purifying our faith to come out to be greater than gold. And this is the fruit of true faith that comes out of the fire of affliction. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Again, the same nuance here. All different kinds of suffering that we go through. Why should we count it a joy? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Testing of the faith produces something in us that we would not gain apart from it. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Trials can develop areas of our faith and character like nothing else can. It is both a test that reveals and refines true faith. And when we hold on to him, when we trust him, when we choose that in the midst of the pain, God, I'm going to still trust you, I'm going to still hope in you, I'm still going to hold on to you, you pass the test. And it will result in great reward and honor in the end. Verse 7, so that the test of genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result, what? True faith that trusts in him through pain. That kind of faith may be found to result in what? In praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Purified faith, persevering faith will result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus returns. Amen. So trials are temporary, and that is good news. They will not last forever if you are in Christ. They serve a purpose, and part of that purpose is to be a test to reveal our faith, to refine our faith. 
And there is one more note of encouragement that we learn from Peter today. And that is trials are a testimony. So everyone repeat, trials are a testimony. Trials serve as a testimony. How? By showing the world true faith, what we really love, and what matters to us the most. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him, Jesus. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So this is, a, this is speaking of true faith and true love for Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. That is true faith and true love. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. That is true faith. And in the midst of the storms of life, when we still trust him, it tells the world as our testimony that Jesus is worth more to me than anything else. And that is a testimony of love. You see, we, what we long for in our pain, who we turn to in our trials, is a testimony of our love for them. You know, one time Enoch slipped uh, outside and he hit his head hard uh, on the floor. And he was screaming in pain. And who does he call for? Mommy, right? Not daddy. He always calls for mommy. I don't know why. Right? I'm always there holding him. But he always calls for mommy. Uh, he wants to be held. He's in pain. He wants to be comforted by mommy because he loves mommy so much. Now, one of the things that I realized is that, like, if it was me and you just hit your head hard, all you can be is, ow, right? That's all the energy that I have for, ah. But he has more energy. He goes, ah, mommy. Ah, mommy. I hold him, no. He has the energy to push me away. I say, not you, you're not mommy, mommy, right? In the midst of his pain, he can gather more energy to still call out for and reach out for mommy. <laughs> that trial becomes a testimony of his love for mommy. <laughs> and one day it'll be for daddy too. But that is how trials function as a testimony. Johannes was 18 years old, a believer from a young age in Indonesia. The last car, Jihad militia, was attacking his village and killing all those who professed faith in Christ. When they reached his hut, they saw a cross, and he was given an option with a machete in their hands. Deny Christ or face this. And he still held on to Christ. And he says, I will never give up Christ. And so with the machete, they ripped off his ear. They said, deny Christ, or face this. And though his head was now severely bleeding, he said, no, I love Jesus too much. They slit his throat. They slit his shoulder. They slit his arm. And as blood was still gushing through parts of his body, he still said, I love Jesus more than my life. That trial became a testimony of his love for Jesus. Trials function as a testimony that reveals what we really love by showing the world what we are really longing for during our time of pain. In your days of suffering, what are you longing for? What are you reaching for? Mommy, ice cream, <laughs> shopping, boyfriend, girlfriend. That is your testimony of who you really love. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this temporary time, are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Pray for corrected vision so that when pain comes, you will see it not through the lens of an unbeliever whose hope is only in this world, but pray for eyes to be able to see beyond this temporary pain and know that those who hold on to Jesus when it's so hard, you will receive glory in the end. Trials point us to what we really love, who we turn to for comforts, and when it is Jesus, it brings great glory and honor. So why is this kind of faith, why is this kind of love, why is this kind of testimony so crucial for our souls? Because that is what signifies true saving faith. Verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. True saving faith. You may go through ups and downs, you'll fail at times, but true saving faith will hold on to Jesus till the very end. Faith that trusts in Christ, not just one time in our lives, but through the duration of our lives, that is saving faith. Francisco was a 22-year-old Bible college student in Peru. Bright future ahead of him, one of the top students in his class. But his future took a surprising turn because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Senderista terrorists were creating chaos throughout Peru during the 1990s, murdering many people throughout the village areas and killing many believers along the way. Their terror throughout the countrysides of Peru caused the city of Lima to explode in growth to over 7 million people in a short amount of time because they were looking for safety. But what they realized was the terrorists eventually invaded the city as well. So there was chaos that invaded Lima too. One day as Francisco was walking past the National Palace, a car sped by, left a bomb in its wake, and it exploded in the National Palace. The police came quickly, found Francisco nearby, arrested him, and thought he was part of the terrorist group and put him in jail. So he was thrown inside the maximum security prison on the fourth floor that was dedicated just to this terrorist group. He had no time to argue his case, and he has no time to prove he was an innocent man. How would you feel? Suddenly, a Bible student walking toward, next to the National Palace, suddenly you hear an explosion. Next thing that you know, you're not only in jail, you are in jail with 500 other terrorists that they believe that you are a part of. Francisco didn't complain. He didn't get mad at God. He actually saw it as an answer to prayer. How? You see, for the past several months, as the terrorists wreaked havoc throughout the nation, he began praying, saying, God, give me opportunities to bring the gospel to these terrorists. I don't want to flee my country in fear. I want to attack them with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he was praying that for months, saying, God, give me an opportunity to bring the gospel to these senderista terrorists. And God answered his prayer in a very surprising way. He was now finding himself surrounded by more than 500 of these terrorists that he was hoping to meet one day inside this maximum security prison. He didn't waste time by complaining about his situation. He saw it through the lens of faith as an answer to his prayers. And he began sharing the gospel to these terrorists while in jail. One lady named Maria, listen carefully, she was 24 years old and her main task as part of this terrorist group is after they injured various victims, her role was to take a gun and shoot at the head of these injured victims to make sure that they were dead. 
As she heard the gospel, she asked Francisco, could God really love and forgive me because of all the sins and the murders that I've committed throughout the past several years? That day she gave her life to Jesus and found out that no sins were too great that Christ could not forgive. A year passed before Francisco saw the court judge. So he spent a year in jail before he even saw a trial. A year in prison unfairly. But during that year, Francisco led more than 60 people to Christ. There is now a church in that prison filled with new believers brought to Jesus Christ through the faithful and courageous witness of Francisco. These killers of men now became children of God. A man who went to prison unfairly but trusted in the sovereignty of God because he knew that he served a God who had a purpose behind every pain. Because he trusted in a God who knew that there was a purpose even in the seasons of prison. I know that there are some of you who are going through a season of suffering and there are some of you who are going through a season where you feel like you are in prison because of how hard it has been. But the message that Jesus has for you is that there is hope and his name is Jesus. And when you hope in him, in pain, in prison, what will result in the end? When this season ends is glory. There is glory and honor that awaits all who went through the school of suffering. With faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that with you there is always hope. And we thank you for the reminder today that even this season of suffering that many of us are going through, that this too will end one day. Father, I ask that you would strengthen faith in this room to trust you, to hope in you, to believe in you, even when we cannot understand why things are happening the way they are. You are God and we are not. And your mind is greater. Your ways are higher. And in the midst of the mystery, I pray for faith that will hope and hold onto you always. We also pray for our brothers and sisters in Iraq right now and in Syria, that they too would remain in you, trusting in Jesus despite the storm, treasuring Jesus more than anything this world has to offer. So God, protect our brothers and sisters and may they be faithful to the very end. And God, I also pray for all who are going through deep, deep pain that you would hold them and embrace them now and let them know that they are not alone and that they are never alone and that you have not forgotten them. You have not given up on them. God, you weep with them. So strengthen your children today in your embrace. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling through every season of suffering, through every storm, to him who is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory without fault, but with great joy, 
to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, power, praise, authority. Before all time, be exalted in our hearts now and be exalted in our hearts forever. Amen.